Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I am loving our testimonies. Somebody here are loving our testimonies. Hallelujah. Well, we are in the book of Revelation, and if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Revelation chapter 3. Uh, we'll be looking at verses 14 to 22 this morning. We, are, we have been working our way through the seven messages to the seven churches. We're in the seventh message today, which is to the church of Laodicea. And, and I just want to remind you that, you know, we're, in, we're encouraging you to get revved up in this day and this hour. The reality is Jesus is coming back soon. Amen? And we just need to be reminded and we need to get excited and we need to understand that he is the one who keeps his promises and what he says will come to pass he also promises he'll never leave us, nor forsake us, nor abandon us, even if we raise our fist at him. Amen? He is that loving and that forgiving when we genuinely repent and ask for forgiveness. And, and I just thank the Lord that, you know, as we're looking at the messages to these seven churches, I'm reminded of the book of Revelation. It's kind of my, my, my pick as the main verse of this entire book is they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. I did a little search this week, just kind of curious to see how many martyrs there have been throughout history. And uh, the most accurate count I could find was off a couple different websites. I kind of combined them together. 69 million people have given their life literally for Jesus Christ. Think about that. Now, that's the people who have given up their life in the midst of sharing their faith, sharing their story, sharing their testimony. And I don't know about you, but isn't that amazing when you think about it? 69 million people have given their life up because they knew Jesus was the only way. And they knew the people, even the people persecuting them and killing them and doing all the manner of evil that they did to them, needed to hear the message of Jesus. So I, I just wanted you to per, you know, process that a little bit, think about that for a moment. But, you know, so as we have been progressing through the seven churches, we've talked about Ephesus, the loveless church. We've talked about Smyrna, the persecuted church. We've talked about Pergamos. Uh, which is the compromising church. We talked about Thyatira, the corrupt church. We talked uh, about Sardis, the church of the walking dead. And then last week, we talked about Philadelphia, the faithful church. There's only two churches in the seven, by the way, that are never reprimanded for doing anything wrong. One is Smyrna, and the other one is Philadelphia. Uh, They just received compliment upon compliment upon compliment from Jesus Christ for the work that they were doing in their city. But today, we are going to look at another church. And before we jump into looking at Laodicea a little bit more in detail today, I just want to remind you, as we look at these messages that were given to these different churches that were literal, historic churches of the day, Uh, The message came about 95 A.D. Of course, Jesus gave it to John on the island of Patmos. Uh, Jesus supernaturally got him released from the island of Patmos. He brought this revelation back to these churches in written form. And each one of these churches, that message to that church was read in their church. And the message came from Jesus Christ himself. And John makes that very clear in Revelation chapter 1 and then throughout this entire uh, amazing book of the Bible. And so I, I just want us to think about this for, for a minute. The, the, the encouragement is that each one of these churches would be an irresistible church for the kingdom of heaven, amen? I, I mean, and some of them were living up to it, but some of them weren't living up to it. And, and, and we've been going through a book as a staff called The Irres- Irresistible Church by Wayne Cordero. Uh, Wayne Cordero, he pastors uh, New Hope Church in Hawaii. And in his book, he talks about characteristics of an irresistible church. Now, some people misperceive what it means to become an irresistible church in our day and in our era. And he makes it very clear, and I'm just going to read exactly what he says. He says, what I mean by irresistible, he says, 
It means more than people being drawn to a church, although this is likely to happen, but hopefully as a byproduct of something more important. He says, my hope is that as churches bear these characteristics revealed in this book, that they become not irresistible to other people, but they become irresistible to heaven and to God Almighty. See, being irresistible means we're irresistible to God. And he says this book is about a church heaven can't but help, can't but applaud, a one that he is deeply involved in, a church that God wants to bless and pour out his blessings on. It's a church that brings forth eternal hope and eternal promises. It's a church that makes the angels of God shout, encore! Amen? And that's the kind of church we want to be. Christian Hills Church wants to be irresistible to heaven. We want to be irresistible to God. If we ever got a message like these churches receive messages from Jesus Christ himself, you know, I've asked this question, what do you think he would say to Christian Hills Church and School? What do you think he would applaud us for? What do you think he would caution us about? What do you think he would promise us? What do you think he would say to us as the church of Jesus Christ today that sits up on top of this hill? And so I'm just challenging us to think about that. What does it mean? I also have shared in Revelation that we have been looking at the different blessings revealed in Revelation. We've actually looked at three of them to date. And we're still in Revelation 16, 15 is where this blessing comes from. And it says, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Now, by the way, nakedness is always a symbol of spiritual shame in the Bible. And and it talks about this idea that people who are naked, they don't have on the clothes of Jesus Christ. They don't put on his righteousness. They don't put on his armor. They're shamefully exposed because of their sin, removes all the blessings that God has for them. You can read that in Ezekiel 16.35 and 2 Corinthians 5.3. But the point to these seven churches, which I think we need to grab a hold of today, is we need to make sure that we don't fall asleep, that we stay awake at what the mission is God has for us, for our church, our specific church, our school, and why God has this church placed on top of this hill for such a time as this. We need to know why we're here. See, the reality is, is if we don't understand who we are, if we don't understand why we're here, we don't know what we're doing, amen? So we need to know what we're doing. We need to know why we're here. We need to know who we are. One of the things that uh, Wayne Cordero says is, as the church of Jesus Christ, we need to know who we are, amen? Amen? And we need to know that God has his hand on this church. God walks up and down the aisles. God's presence was here this morning. I, I, I once again uh, uh, applaud Beth on being sensitive to what the Holy Spirit's saying. And even in my prayer time today, you know, three names came to mind as I was praying this morning in the gym. Uh, one person's name was Ann, and the Lord said, hey, look up Psalm 32, 6 through 8. And basically, the message that I felt the Lord laid on my heart to share is, he is your hiding place and your place of refuge. Another person that was laid on my heart is Patricia. And you need to look up Psalm 42, 6 through 8, because God sees your soul, and he is energizing you from within, and you just need to trust him. Then Ed came to mind, Psalm 102, verse 1 through 7. God hears your prayers. Sometimes we don't think God hears our prayers but can we say amen? He does. And then lastly, a person who came to mind, and I don't know who all these people are exactly, a person by the name of Sean. And the Lord wants you to look at Jeremiah chapter 42, verses 2 through 4, because he is going to answer your petition and bring new life into your life. And whether there are people listening to us online or a person sitting here today, my encouragement is God still speaks to his people today. And we just need to hear his voice, you know. All the way through at the end of every one of these messages to the church, it says that we need to hear 
what the Spirit is saying today, amen? So we need to hear God's voice. We need to hear God's voice in our life every single day. We need to hear what he's directing us to do and not to do. We need to hear his warnings. We need to learn, you know, uh, you're going the wrong way. Change directions. Go this way. And these churches are receiving these types of personal messages from Jesus himself. And so I just want to challenge you. Do not allow the busyness of this world to get you to lose your intimacy with Jesus. Because the churches that had problems and were addressed here, some of them, five out of the seven, by the way, had lost their intimacy with Jesus. So what does it mean to have intimacy? I've been kind of asking that question a lot. I've asked my staff. I asked Isa. Isa said intimacy with God is going and having dinner with him. Amen? I think that's great. Intimacy with God is spending time with him. And we're going to see that in our text, by the way. As the Lord says, I I knock at the door, and, and I want you to answer the door so I can come in and have food with you and fellowship with you. It says that in our text here in in Revelation chapter 3 to the Laodicean church. Lord desires to fellowship and have intimacy with us. But we have to carve out that time in our busy schedule so we stay in tune and are able to hear when he is speaking to us. Can I hear an amen to that? So let's look at the church in Laodicea. Let's look at the message to this church. And like I said, it's found in verses 14 to 22, so you can find that text there, and I'll read it in a moment. But as I was kind of thinking about, you know, what causes a church to fade away? What causes a church like Laodicea to become, as it says in our text, lukewarm, neither hot, neither cold, kind of, well, it's kind of like ho-hum, whatever happens, happens. There's no zeal for God. There's no excitement for God. There's no fire for God. It's It's just like we're going through the motion. And, you know, what happens to a church that becomes like that? You see, the ministry of the church is a ministry of people. I want you to hear this. When a church lives, it lives because the people within it are vital and active and alive in their spiritual realm. When a church dies, it withers and dies, not because the brick and the mortar are collapsing or the carpet is worn out or the pews get old and and things start to crack and rip and crumble. See, that's not how a church dies. You see, a church withers and dies because the people who are part of that church allow themselves to wither and die. And so I came across this true illustration. It's shared by Chuck Swindoll. And he says he knew of a young minister, fresh out of seminary, bright-eyed, excited, had stars in his eyes, was excited to go pastor his first church in Oklahoma. And he was really pumped up because the church in Oklahoma that he was called to be the lead pastor to was a church that was known for doing great and mighty things in their community. And he had great hopes for the future of this church. And and he had heard that they had kind of fallen into apathy and had kind of been ho-hum about ministry and had kind of lost their luster and their zeal and they had kind of lost their fire for the things of God. But he thought, you know, I'm going to bring it. I'm going to bring it to this church, and I'm going to get them fired back up, and they're going to reach this community, and they're going to serve this community, and they're going to see a harvest come in. And he was so fired up. And then after about three years, he was discouraged. Because after three years of him pouring his heart and his soul into ministry and his preaching and, and trying to fire the church up, he didn't think anything was happening. And he tried all these different ideas, and nothing seemed to work. And then finally, he was in prayer one night, and he decided that on Saturday, he was going to go to the newspaper, the local newspaper, and he was going to put in and and pull a front page ad in the newspaper that there would be a funeral service for this church Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, that the church had literally died. 
And he was inviting the entire town out to the church's funeral because he was going to he was going to basically do the funeral for this church. And he puts the name of the church on the front page of the paper. And of course, a lot of the people in the church weren't so happy to find out their church was dead. And there was a funeral for their dead church. And so interesting enough, he said Sundays hadn't been packed out in a long time, but for this service, there was standing room only in the church. People had lined the walls, and people came from all over the place to see what this young minister was going to do, because he's having a funeral service for his church, which he says has died. So he gets up there, and he does the eulogy, and he talks about how once this church was great and how once the church did this and that and all these other things, but she had fallen ill and had finally died. So he, you know, so all these people were there, and he goes through the eulogy, and he talks about all the things she used to do and how no longer she was doing any of that, and the people were a little bit in shock as the things that he's saying because, well, most of them kind of knew. They didn't think the church was dead, but he's letting them know the church is dead. And by the time he was done, what was amazing is when they came into the service, he literally had a casket down front, which was closed. Flowers all over the casket. And when he was done with his eulogy, he came off the stage, he opened the casket, he moved the flowers back, and he went back up to the stage and he says to the church, you can now come and see what this dead church looks like lying in a casket. People, they were a little bit curious to find out what's in the casket. So he said, it's open, come for your last viewing of this church. And he says, and when you're all done, I'll say the final prayer, and we'll go out and bury this puppy in the cemetery. And people started filing past the casket. It was kind of interesting because, well, the newspaper was there because, well, this was big news. The church had died. And so they're reporting that they were wondered, you know, the newspaper reporter was wondering what's in the casket because people would come up to the casket, they would look in, and they'd almost get like a little bit as white as ghosts and like a little bit of shock and a little bit of conviction as they kind of walked away. And, and the reporter's sitting there thinking, what's in the casket? Because he, he couldn't see anything. And it was interesting that he got in line. And people filed by one by one to look in, and many of them left sheepishly, many of them looking guilty, many of them turning white, and, and, they, and, and many of them weren't saying much as they walked past the casket and walked out the door. When he came to the casket, he looked down into the casket and was amazed at what he saw. Laying on the bottom of the casket was a mirror. And everybody who looked down to the casket at this dead church realized they were the church that was dead. Isn't that an amazing story? I applaud that minister, number one. What an idea God gave him, amen? But it's true. Churches die because the people wither and die within the church. But if the people stay alive and they keep their relationship with Jesus fired up, guess what? Things happen, amen? So let's look at Laodicea. Now, it's important for us to be reminded who's giving them the message. I'll read you the text here. Uh, but it's an interesting uh, set of verses. By the way, I think Laodicea, in my view, uh, probably looks to be the worst out of all seven of the churches, by the way. It says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right, these are the words of the amen. Now, this is the person giving them the message, the personal message to their church about their situation and what's happening. The faithful and true witness, also describing who this person is, the ruler, I love this phrase, the ruler of God's creation is literally giving them this personal message. Now, that should get your attention, amen? If this was a message of Christian Hills and and we knew it was the amen. And by the way, kind of way to say the amen is, is the yes of God. The yes of God, Jesus, is the one giving them this message. He sees, he knows, he knows what's going on in their church. He is also the ruler of God's creation. He says, I know your deeds, 
that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Pause right there. I find it interesting that the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the ruler of God's creation says to this church, I know everything about you because I am the yes of God and whatever I say will come to pass and it doesn't matter whether you're faithful or not, I'm always faithful to the church and whatever I say the church is going to do, the church will succeed in spite of what you do or don't do. Can Can you say amen to that? You know, churches fail. People fail. Churches die. Doors close. But God's true church will never die. Because the amen, the faithful, the true witness, tells the truth, promises they will storm the gates of hell and they will defeat the gates of hell. The devil does not win. Just read the book of Revelation. The devil loses, evil loses, and God wins. Amen? And so, in spite of what's going on in this church, this lukewarm church that God is about to spit out of his mouth, they need to be aware of something. God's true church will always move on, and it will get to the finish line, and it will bring victory, in spite of the people who may or may not be a part of that. goes on to say, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. See, can I tell you what a problem is for this church in Laodicea? This city, by the way, last week I talked about uh, the city that wasn't, you know, uh, very, very big. Philadelphia was a city that had gone through an earthquake, quake, never really recovered. Some people still lived outside the city, the city of Philadelphia. But this city, by the way, was very, very wealthy. So when the earthquake hit this city like it hit the, the city of Philadelphia, they had so much money they rebuilt in a heartbeat and never borrowed any money even from the Roman Empire. And the church was very wealthy. Uh, Their main product that they exported was a black wool that was in high demand in that day. And so they were a very wealthy city and church. And it's interesting that the Lord, the amen, the true, the faithful witness, the ruler of God's creation looks at them and says, I'm about to spit you out of your mouth, even though you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. And I do not need a thing because I have everything I want. I've got the kind of house I want. I've got the kind of vehicles I want. I've got everything I want. I've got all the riches of the world. So God must be on my side. I must be spiritually mature. I must be a spiritual giant because I have so much going for me. And then notice how the amen says, but (laughs) you don't realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind. Here's that word again, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich because your idea of riches is not my idea of riches. Having money in the bank is not a sign of spiritual maturity. Amen? The sign of spiritual maturity is intimacy with God on a daily basis. He goes on to say, and put on your white clothes to wear because they had taken off the white clothes. That's why they were shamefully exposed. So you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. I want to read that again. Jesus, the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the ruler of God's creation says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Only a person who genuinely loves you will correct you, amen? Because they love you so much, they don't want you to stay in your error of ways. They want to bless you. They don't want you to curse your life. They want to bless your life. They don't want you making wrong choices and decisions. They want you making right choices and decisions so you succeed and you go forward, amen? That's love, tough love. Tough love corrects your kids. Can you say amen to that? I discipline my kids. I don't discipline them anymore. Now I do my grandkids. It's kind of funner. (laughs) But I wouldn't let Emerson go jump off my roof, amen? No matter if he's standing on the roof in his cute little way and say, I love you, Grandpa. 
I'd still yell at him, get off the roof, Emerson, right? I wouldn't let Emerson jump because I don't want Emerson to get hurt. So I discipline him. If you don't love your kids, you won't discipline them. See, we think we love our kids if we don't discipline them. Can I tell you? That came from Dr. Spock, and trust me, he doesn't know what he's doing. By the way, his son committed suicide, just so you know. If you love your kids, you will discipline your kids. Jesus says the same thing to this church because he loves these people. He died enough for them. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. This is such a loving example of Jesus. He doesn't leave us in our position of sinfulness or hopelessness. He knocks on our door. He says, wake up. Open the door. I want to come in and have a meal with you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to forgive you. I want to pour out my blessings on you. I want to share the secrets of the kingdom of heaven with you. I want to do miracles for you. I want to bless you. Open the door. It's a loving sign. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, he says, I will come in and eat with them, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Don't bypass that phrase. He wants to come in and spend time with us so that in the end, we literally sit on the throne with Jesus Christ himself and judge the world and reign with him. How amazing is that? I mean, you, you, you think you got it good today because you're, you're a big shot in your business? How about sitting next to Jesus? And Jesus says, oh, hey, Mike, what do you think we should do with this guy? I don't know, Lord. What should we do? <laughs> you know, I mean, you're reigning with Jesus. That is no small thing to bypass, by the way. You're reigning with the, with the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am. I don't know about you, but that blew my mind this week. I hope it blows your mind. Because that's what is waiting for us. If we do it right. If we serve him with our whole heart. If we just run away from sin and repent of sin and, and come to him and allow him in and spend time in fellowship with him. You know, it's interesting. This, this word lukewarm has some historical context to it in this church. And when they heard lukewarm, it would make a lot of sense to them because of their water supply that they had in this city. See, the city was founded in 261 to 246 BC, probably by Antiochus II, who named it after his wife, who he then divorced in 253 BC, who then proceeded to poison Antiochus, which is kind of interesting because it talks about being lukewarm and spitting out of the mouth and this kind of poison thing. It became a great commercial city, like I said. The city was known for its famous school of medicine. By the way, that's the attachment to you're blind. Take some salve and put it in your eye because the school of medicine uh, produced a salve that actually healed people's eyes so they could see. So that made a whole lot of sense to this church. In this was the temple of the Ferigran god, Men Karu, which was this underworld deity that people worshipped like a fertility god. And that was big in this city as well. But I, but I want to go back to their water supply. You see, the water supply of this city was interesting in that six miles in one direction was the springs of Denzili. And the springs of Denzili would travel about six miles over to Laodicea. But by the time the icy cold water flowed over the plateau there, by the time the water went six miles and reached the city, the water would be somehow polluted and it would be lukewarm. It would have picked up all kinds of lime and anyone who tried to drink it would find out it was poisonous and it would make them sick. So hearing that they made God sick would just immediately register. They're kind of like the water supply in Laodicea that is flowing from Heropolis six miles in one direction. Interesting, now six miles in the other direction of Laodicea was another city. And this place was, um, 
a, a place that was by Heropolis, and they had hot mineral springs. And so they had actually tried to flow water from the hot mineral springs to Laodicea to provide water supply because the other water supply wasn't working. It became poisonous by the time it got there. So they tried to do the same thing with this, like, hot water and bring it over from the other side. And guess what happened? By the time that water got to the city, the water would be once again polluted and poisonous, pick up all kinds of sulfuric stuff, and therefore the city couldn't drink that. So they had tried two different water supplies to the city, but by the time it flowed to each side, either that way or that way, it became poisonous for the city and they couldn't drink it. Well, it's interesting. The Lord says, you're lukewarm. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth because you're like your own water supply. You make me vomit. How many of you know that's not a good thing to be said to by the Lord? It meant that they were non-committed. It meant that they were lackadaisical, half-hearted, indifferent, apathetic, unenthusiastic, spiritless. And the list could go on. They may have had money, but the money wasn't going to get them into heaven. Can you say amen to that? What was going to get them into heaven was their intimacy with God. And he wanted that intimacy with them. That's why he wanted to come into the door and he wanted to fellowship with them. As you get toward the end there, we discover as we progress through our message here that their condition was the worst out of the seven. The church is called lukewarm. We just talked about that. Their self-image was distorted because they thought because they had money, they were in God's favor, but they weren't. They made their creator sick, and then finally they were blind, as I shared, and they needed this salve that would only come from Jesus Christ himself to open their eyes to see how wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked they really were because, well, they had a distorted self-image. And I don't know about you, but we need to understand that God does not like lukewarm Christians, amen? It is not in his vocabulary for you to be lukewarm. He wants fired up, excited, revved up Christians for the kingdom. He wants people that go out there every day and tell them the, the story of what God's done in their life. That's what Jesus wants. And the reality is, if you're a lukewarm Christian... I hate to say this, but you make God gag. Just like the water supply made the city gag. And Jesus wants them to get fired up. He wants to spend time with them. He wants them to understand that they can't be lukewarm. How did they get lukewarm? Well, they, he says, this is why they need to wake up. They started buying into the things of the world and not the things of Jesus. See, they are to buy into what Jesus is promoting, not what the world is promoting. Can you say amen to that? Secondly, they need to put their faith in God and not the world or in riches. Thirdly, this church needed to put on the white clothes of Jesus again because they were currently naked and spiritually dead. The church needed to put salve in their eyes so they could literally see how blind they really were and see things through his eyes, and they needed a healing from the Holy Spirit to be able to see the truth about themselves. But more than anything else in this passage, as I wrap this up here today, they needed to know that the only reason Jesus was giving them this hard message was because he loved them. He wanted to spend time with them. He wanted them to repent. He wanted them to be sincere with him again. He wanted them to put him as their number one priority in their lives every day. And he was knocking on the door of their heart. All they have to do is open their heart and let him in. It's just like Jose did. That's what God wants to do for you. And then when he does, you get to sit with him on his throne in the end times. I don't think it's any better than that, amen? I've kind of always wanted to be the president of the United States, but how about sitting next to Jesus on his throne? I think that's better, amen? And that promise is for all of us, not just me, amen? It's for all of those who call upon the Lord, who draw closer to him, who open that door and let him in. So let's do it, amen? Let's be earnest. Let's make sure our hearts are in the right position and let's let the Holy Spirit have his way. As Beth comes on up, so what do we need to know from our message today? Well, we need to know that Jesus knows everything about us. He knows what makes us lukewarm. He knows what we need to prioritize rightly and correctly in our life. 
He know he need, he knows when we have removed our righteousness and put on the world's clothes. And we need to know that we do need to wake up. We do need to answer the door. We need the new, do need to understand we can't be sleeping. We got to be awake. We got to be revved up. We got to be fired up for his kingdom. So what do we know? We know that Jesus, though, never gives up on his church. Can you say amen to that? He never gives up on anybody who walks away from him. He never gives up on anybody who falls away. And we need to see that the riches and wealth will not bring a spiritual maturity. What will bring a spiritual maturity is spending time intimately with Jesus. See, being lukewarm, lukewarm with the Lord makes God sick. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to make God sick and let him vomit me out of his mouth. Amen? I, I want him to love me and treasure me. See, we need to know this truth. We need to see that love is always knocking and seeking to restore any broken relationship we have with him. Love is intimate and love wants you. Love died for you. We need to do this. We need to wake up, be sincere with Jesus and ourselves, open our blind eyes so we actually see our shameful nakedness and put on his clothes that are sitting there right there that he has provided for us to put on. Because he wants to forgive us. He wants to bless us. He wants to be the Lord of our life. He wants to lead us. He wants to guide us. He wants to give us that great job. He wants to give us that great family. He wants to break the curses off your life. Amen? And give you the blessings of him. But it's our choice to choose it. It's our choice to let him in. It's our choice to accept him as our Lord and Savior. And so my challenge is we're going to pray here in a moment is if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, then I challenge you to come on up front with one of our prayer members, and we will pray with you to do that. Maybe you have accepted Christ, and you've drifted away from him. Can I tell you, Jesus is standing there. Come back. Come back to me. And you can come back right here, right now, right in this moment. And he'll forgive you, and he'll spend time with you, and he'll show you things, and he'll pour out his love and forgiveness all over you. But we're the ones that have to make the choice. He is a perfect gentleman. He never forces his way. He allows you to choose him. And when you choose him, you get the greatest blessings of the universe. And he'll come into you in a new special way. So let's pray. Lord, I just pray for each and every individual that is here today. I pray they have a fresh revelation of you, Jesus, of who you are what you've done in the past for us, what you're doing currently right now, and what you're going to do in the future. And I pray they see you like never before. I pray that you would lay it upon their hearts to give their lives and their hearts to you once again or maybe for the first time. And Lord, I know you have promised that you love us, and that's why you correct us. But Lord, you are (laughs) the ruler of this creation. Lord, you are the amen, the yes the one who is a faithful and true witness and does not tell lies. And Lord, everything you promise in your word will come to pass and everything you promised us will come to pass. So Lord, just have your way in our hearts today, we ask in Jesus' holy name. And the church said, amen. So I'm gonna have my prayer team members come forward. If you would like prayer, come on down front. Rest of you, God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord. And remember, share your story with somebody this week. It could change their life. God bless you. How he loves us.